I thought uh, first I would just tell you quickly about laparoscopy and colon cancer. It should be done. That's the end of the discussion. No, I, we'll talk a little bit more about it. So current concepts, I, we could talk, the, the, the basic things that I'd like to really go through are the risk factors, diagnosis, surgical therapy, chemotherapy, and, and any nor, sort of updates in these areas. In the interest of time and, and for, for the crowd's interest, I thought I'd just focus on these, these two general areas. So uh, surgical therapy, a couple of things. Um, well, first of all, I guess just introductions. So, the, the importance of colon cancer is understood. It's the third most common cancer in the United States. Incidents around 130,000 a year with about 1.1 uh, million patients affected with colon cancer at any given time. Uh, about 5% of Americans will develop colorectal cancer in their lifetime is, is the estimation. Now, the great thing with colon cancer, I think, and one of the reasons I really like to treat colorectal cancer is because we're doing so much better with the, the care of patients. So you can see our, our mortality slides, our incidence slides are actually decreasing. Uh, you can see the incidence in males and females and mortality in, in both groups is, is both on the decrease, on the decline. Now we could go through and discuss why that is. I think it largely comes down to screening and it's part of a different talk, but it, it's, I think it's an interesting phenomenon. Even more interesting is it's not necessarily declining in all races uh, not surprising. And when you look in patients less than 40, it's actually increasing. So the incidence and the mortality is increasing. So there's a lot of interesting uh, uh, phenomena going on with colon cancer that, that are, are really great fodder for research. Uh, but I thought what I'd focus on here today is really just sort of uh, the surgical and the, the medical therapy and anything new that's going on just to bring people up to, up to date on, on some of the, some of the, uh, the issues. The central tenets of, of surgical resection of colon cancer remain the same today as they did in 1902. Uh, it's uh, remove tumor, remove lymph nodes. We now know there's an adequate number and don't spill stool. It's fairly straightforward, right? Don't rupture the tumor. Don't spill the stool all over the abdomen. It makes good sense. Um, the, the, the lymph node, uh, adequate lymph node, and I said at least 12, that's an interesting literature in and of itself and is, is probably worth a, a separate talk and how we've come to that number and is it really that important versus uh, a adequately assessing the, the highest lymph node or the apical node. Uh, it's, a, it's a whole different discussion, but I think a, an interesting one and a, another interesting area for research. The, the, the big buzzword right now, at least in colorectal surgery, is complete mesocolic excision. Has anybody heard that before? Anyone's familiar with this, this topic? We know about it with rectal cancer, a total mesorectal excision. Um, and, and this really was coined, this complete mesocolic excision was coined uh, back in 2009 by a German group. They really broke, they took it from Heald's work uh, around the total mesorectal excision. Bill Heald, you'll recall, is the famous a uh, rectal cancer surgeon from Great Britain who really coined the term total mesorectal excision, kind of excising the rectum on block with the lymphovascular envelope. And it really, I mean, uh, undoubtedly has shown to decrease the rate of local recurrence. Just good, adequate surgery. Well, this, sur this German group then decided, well, the same thing can apply to colon cancer, and we'll call this the complete mesocolic excision. And what they, what they talk about is, is the different planes of the, of the colon, the different planes that are of attachments. So they describe Tolt's fascia here with the colofascial interface and the, the retrofascial interface. And then having a couple of different ways to resect this. One is, is what they call the, uh, the mesofascial separation where you're leaving Tolt's fascia down in the retroperitoneum, just taking the mesentery. And the other is a retrofascial excision where you're bringing Tolt's fascia with you. And so what they're gonna argue is that this retrofascial separation is really important for local recurrence. And we're just gonna look at some of, their, some of their results here. So first of all, just to show you some data, this is a review published in the World Journal of GI Surgery. It's just an outstanding journal. No, not really. It's an impact factor of about 0.5. I 
but they published the, the, their review here. And what it shows is um, basically if you do this um, uh, central vascular ligation associated with a mesocolic excision, you have an increased number of lymph nodes. You can see that 13, uh, 30 lymph nodes versus 18. And the, and the length of the mesentery is, is longer. Does any of that matter? Well, when you look over in survival, there's really very little difference in survival, very little difference in local recurrence. And, and bottom line is the surgeons haven't really studied it. I, I think this is a, a bit of a buzzword that, that um, gives people some sense that they're doing something different. But I would argue it's really just about good surgery. So when you look at the pictures they show, and I'm gonna show a couple of them, I'm gonna ask you guys, is this really good surgery, a complete mesocolic versus non-mesocolic excision? So here's their first example of a CME, a complete mesocolic excision of a sigmoid, and a standard sigmoid. I don't know about any of you, but my standard sigmoid doesn't really look like this. It, it, there's actually a, 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 an IMA stump to it. So basically what they're showing here is somebody who's gone through and taken the sigmoidal arteries. That's not even close to a cancer operation. It gets worse from here. Here's a complete mesocolic excision right, and here's a standard right. Looks like a dog chewed it out of the patient. And it even gets worse when you look at the extended right. Look at this, the complete mesocolic extended right colon and the standard right colon. This looks like somebody just reached in with their ham hands and just jerked it out of the patient. I, I mean, of course the outcomes are better when you do a good operation versus a terrible operation. It doesn't make, so to, talk complete mesocolic excision to me is just confusing the issue. I would say do a good operation, do a good high ligation of, the, of your central vascular supply, look at the lymph nodes, try to keep the specimen intact. When you look at more of these data, and Phil Kirk, the, uh, the pathologist who's written a lot of the total mesorectal excision work with, with uh, uh, Bill Heald, Phil Kirk has written some papers on this complete mesocolic excision. He actually shows perforation of the colon saying, well, when you don't do a complete mesocolic excision, you get into the colon. I, I don't, I mean, yeah, if you don't know what you're doing, you get into the colon, that's a true statement. So I think we're really just talking about something to talk about something and to try to make people famous, not necessarily trying to improve care. The bottom line is do good surgery. And then can the surgery be done laparoscopically? Like I said, the answer is yes. And we know that through lots of different randomized controlled trials, including the American College of Surgery and Oncology group, the COST trial. So here's, here's um, two, four, five different uh, randomized controlled trials basically showing that your local recurrence rate between open and laparoscopic surgery is no different. And your uh, disease-free survival is no different between open and laparoscopic surgery. Just suggesting that at least laparoscopy is not inferior. Now if we ask, is laparoscopy actually superior on some level? So do patients recover better? Uh, do they have a, an improved outcome? Something like that. When we look specifically at these, at these uh, these randomized controlled trials, the answer is, well, maybe, but maybe not. Certainly there's a shorter length of stay, so the length of stay in the laparoscopic group in the blue bars is, is shorter in almost every, every study. But the morbidity, the complications are, are about the same in the majority of them. Now, I, I personally think it's because of the bias of a randomized controlled trial. When you look at the selection criteria for the randomized controlled trials, especially the American College of Surgery, the COST trial, they really had to be the healthiest of healthy patients with BMIs less than 30. Lo and behold, if you take a group of young, healthy patients, you can operate on them any way you want and they do well, right? It's not really surprising. When you actually start looking though at, at the more complicated patient groups, the elderly, you know, the older adult population, the, pa the population with uh, ASA class four, that sort of thing. Turns out these groups of patients really do much better with laparoscopy. I don't exactly know why, there's probably some good science to it, uh, but all of the, the data here would suggest that these patients really do uh, have an improved outcomes with laparoscopic operations. So uh, personally, I think it's really the gold standard. The, the next question though is really, um, what about robotics? Where are we there with the abdominal colon work? Should we all be using the robot instead of a laparoscope? 
the lapar laparoscope, as we know, is, is really sort of popularized back in the 80s through the 90s. Now we have this fancy robotic machine that our hospitals are buying and asking us to use it. Perhaps we should be doing everything robotically. Well, you know, first question, I guess, is why? Well, you know, laparoscopy, we do, there are some difficulties, right? Especially doing colon surgery laparoscopically. You lose your binoc binocular vision. It's definitely a, a, a one-dimensional phenomenon here. Um, there's a paradoxical motion of instruments. Oftentimes, you end up working backwards, and so the, the motion of instruments is not at all intuitive. Um, there's you some amplified movements, so small movements look very big on the, on the screen and, and can be very large. Uh, you have a lot of parallel instrumentation, so it's, it's difficult to grab the colon and move the colon where you want it to be necessarily. And then, of course, the ergonomics. For those of us who do a lot of laparoscopy, we can all vouch that the ergonomics can be terrible here. At the end of the case, you can feel like you've been uh, exercising for the last two hours. Your back hurts, your leg, legs hurt, your arms and shoulders hurt. It, it, the ergonomics is just poor. Robotics solves a lot of that. Several studies have actually found no difference between laparoscopic and ro robotically performed colon operations, whether it's right or left. Now, you can find studies that show differences, but by and large, those studies are, are really underpowered. They're retrospective. There's really, uh, most studies have really shown no differences in outcomes. Now, when you look at robotic versus, la versus open, lo and behold, you find the same differences between lap versus open. The educational learning curve for the robot perhaps is less than, 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 than laparoscopic surgery, so if you're not comfortable with a laparoscopy, perhaps robotics has a, has a lower uh, learning curve, perhaps might be a little bit easier to, to learn how to do uh, robotics, but even that is a little bit questionable. Now, I would argue that robotic approach is simply a minimally invasive approach. So if we have people who are largely doing open surgery, because laparoscopy is difficult for colon surgery, robotics may make it easier. And when we look at this large study, uh, look at using the NIS database, um, essentially from 09 to 12, 509,000 patients who underwent colectomy. You see the numbers here, open, lap, and robotic. And this is from Jeff Milsom's group up in uh, New York. What we end up seeing is that the complications and the outcomes between robotic and laparoscopy are largely no different. Um, of course, with open, when you compare to open, there are significant differences. Now, the interesting thing is the iatrogenic complications of robotic is different. Um, so there seems to be more iatrogenic complications in the robotic group, and, and that's been shown in other studies as well. And I think those complications go down as people get through their learning curve, but at least early on, there do seem to be more iatrogenic complications. For those who've done robotic surgery, um, I would argue it's, it's movement of, of instruments off the screen that you can't see. That's probably what results in a lot of these iatrogenic complications. Um, as you know, you, you really lose all, once, you're, once you sit down at that, at that console and put your head in there, you have no idea what's going on at the table. So if you can't see your instrument on the screen, you have no idea where it is in general. And so trying to move that instrument when it's off the screen uh, you can go through many things, bowel, aorta, whatever you go through, and it's all, and, and they've all been, any, anything that can be injured has been injured robotically. You just have to look for the reports. So next, let's just get into chemotherapy just a little bit, and let's first talk about what's not debatable, and then we're going to talk about what is debatable and where might we go. So what's not debatable is that patients with lymph node positive cancer have improved outcomes when treated with chemotherapy, and this really dates back to the, to the 1980s. This is uh, NSABP's early work, Bernie Fisher. Uh, the same guy who did all the breast cancer work did work in colon cancer as well, and really just showed that patients randomized to surgery alone or surgery followed by chemotherapy. Chemotherapy resulted in some improved outcomes. Now, the chemotherapy at the time was basically 5-FU alone, essentially 5-FU and, and leucovorin. That was it. Um, we now know with the Mosaic trial publication published back in 2009 that full FOX is our current standard of care. When you look at the data here, patients randomized to full FOX with stage 3 disease versus uh, 5-FU and leucovorin with stage 3 disease, they did better. 
The question here might become in the stage two, that, that could certainly be uh, a, an area of interest and there's a lot of work going on in stage two to try to find out who's at higher risk, who might benefit from chemotherapy. The other area that's really interesting in my mind is neoadjuvant therapy. So we know neoadjuvant therapy or preoperative therapy has a good foothold in, in rectal cancer with preoperative chemoradiation. It's really unquestionable. It decreases rates of local recurrence. The question in, ke in colon cancer is the same. It, might patients with high-risk disease benefit from preoperative chemotherapy? The theoretical benefits you get are potential tumor downstaging, some eradication of micrometastases, the chemotherapy itself may be better tolerated, just like in, in rectal cancer. Chemoradiation is better tolerated if given preoperatively. The same may be true in colon cancer. And the delay in adjuvant therapy, we know if we delay adjuvant therapy more than 12 weeks after surgery, patients do worse. So we could eliminate that delay by treating them up front. And then I think another valid point is it's a good biologic challenge. You can see how the tumor responds to chemotherapy. Turns out there's a randomized controlled trial called the Foxtrot trial. It has uh, completed uh, 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 enrollment, but now we're just waiting for it to mature to see the, the final results. We do have some early results. So this is uh, patients are randomized to uh, this uh, full Fox plus panitumumab, which is an EGFR antibody in KRAS wild type patients. They're randomized to that preoperatively versus postoperative. And, um, and this, the, to inclusion here is high risk patients, T4 or T3 with extramural depth greater than five millimeter and staging determined by preoperative therapy. The randomization scheme looks like this. So we have uh, the uh, OX plus times six weeks preoperative or OX plus panitumumab six weeks followed by surgery, followed by more chemotherapy versus surgery followed by chemotherapy. It's, that, it's fairly straightforward randomization. Uh, Again, long-term results are pending. What we have is one short-term uh, result published in Lancet Oncology. 60% of patients are node negative versus 48% pre-op versus post-op, suggesting there's some downstaging. We also have increased tumor regression in the pre-op, increased number of patients with T0 and T2 lesions in the pre-op. So again, just suggesting some tumor downstaging. It'll be interesting to see if we have uh, any long-term effects of these. So, uh, I think there's a number of questions that remain to be answered here. First of all, ideal screening tool, um, I think has a really interesting t uh, uh, area of research. Improvement of chemotherapy, length of time of adjuvant therapy, use of neoadjuvant, and prognosis and surgery. I think surgery, what I'm excited to see is new technology and, and where we go next. So uh, with that, I'll uh, look forward to the question and answer session at the end.